Today, I'm joined by Lisa, who's been sober for almost three years, and she's been exploring the roots of why she started drinking in the first place and developed an alcohol problem. Not only did she explore it, she wrote a book about it. Lisa, thank you for joining me. It's great to have you here. Hi, Simon. Really great to be talking to you today. Yeah, it's lovely. Thanks for coming on the channel. I'm so excited to hear more about your journey, your story, what you discovered on the way, how you got to the roots of why you started drinking in the first place. And of course, I want to learn about the book that you've written as well. So where should we begin? Let's start talking about what happened before you quit drinking and what life was like. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm one of those classic um, kind of midlife women. I'm 54. And I think many of us started drinking in the 90s. We were the cool girl generation um, uh, written about so well by um, in the book Gone Girl. I was one of those Ladettes who, yeah. you know, um, in the, that Spice Girl era of new female expression and independence, we all you know, started drinking with the boys. I was living in Brighton, started drinking Stella, even though it was way too strong for me and I always ended up crying in the toilets. But we took it as an expression of our independence um, and liberation, weirdly, <laughs> not realising that from that very moment, um, our addictions were, were born. And I didn't know that until I started writing my story. So I started writing my story in 2019. Um, having just uh, given up at that point. So I'm three years sober in January and I was writing it in India, having come the full journey. And I started to explore where the drinking began. It was very clear it was in the 90s, in that era of like um, enabled, endorsed drinking. Yeah. And yeah. those uh, Indian bands have a lot to answer for. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but for me, there was a kind of perfect storm of things happening. So, I'd already lost my dad when I was 10 and I was unaware of the impact of that until much, much, much later, which the book does explore. And um, uh, at the same time, my mum was on a downward trajectory with dementia. Um, she was in North Wales, my home country. I was in Brighton, the other end of the country, kind of hiding from it. And I also numbed everything around it with increasing amounts of what then became white wine. I worked in publishing and we all we were all Bridget Jones you know yeah. the whose best relationship was with a a bottle of wine Chardonnay <laughs> so I was that Chardonnay generation and just I just didn't know that that those were the triggers for it the grief and the trauma and what built over time was you know an increasingly stressful job in publishing which added into the need to numb and it just kind of steamrolled, steamrolled on it. And I think it creeps up on you. And I think lots of people, not just women my age, would say it's that slow creep. And before you don't realize you're addicted. In fact, the word addiction isn't really associated with um, drinking in, in that respect. It kind of is with alcoholism. But what we're doing is alcoholism. I find there's a lot of denial around that. So I tried to explore all of these things in my book. Yeah, that is so true the way that it just creeps up on you and you don't kind of identify as, you know, I've got a problem here. I can't stop drinking. I'm drinking every day or I'm binge drinking. Uh, and mm -hmm. be but before you know it, you know, there, co there comes a point for all of us, I think, where the universe slaps us in the face one way or another <laughs> and, and says, you need to take a look at this. You've got to look closer. You know, and for me, that was the impact it was having on my relationships, my emotional state and my career, my health, you know, you name it, and my ability to parent. And I think eventually we all have this wake up call one, one way or another. But yeah, it's so much of what you said, I completely relate to even the sort of time frame. I'm a few years younger than you, but not many. And I I, I hear you around the 1990s and that drinking culture and everything else that that followed and also that kind of numbing out and really change it instead of looking at why we feel the way we feel changing the way we feel through alcohol 
Yeah, I mean, I just I just didn't know I was doing it. I was like many of us. I was I viewed with suspicion people who weren't drinking. Yeah. I just thought there was something wrong with them. Why weren't they joining in? I didn't, I didn't realize I was doing that thing of, you know, needing to have validation of my own activity by including other people in it um and I just kept away from those people but really if I if I'd known they held the key yeah. <laughs> to happiness or or just a clear head and and you know a, a normal life I would have included them more I think I just didn't want to face it and I think many of us just can't face reality without it it's really hard isn't it and I yeah. you know I need I just kept going and in publishing, it was just, you know, there isn't a moment that isn't celebrate, celebrated with without Prosecco or champagne. And um, and then I started, you know, I had my career that was going, so book launch after book launch, Prosecco, almost, in fact, I moved into an office once where they literally had a Prosecco tap. Oh um, and everyone was so excited. I was uh, sober by then and I saw everyone else's excitement around it and I thought, God, that would be actually the death of me. But I knew there was something wrong when, well, I started to realise that when I organised a Prosecco hour for my team, for the team, I, yeah. I now look back and go, who was that really for? It was me. Um making sure I was, you know, had my drinking validated on a Friday evening with my team. And a lot of the younger people just started to pull away from it. And me and the older ones would be going, no, oh, you don't, you know, they don't know how to party these days. But really, <laughs> they were kind of just trying to be well and normal and going off to do yoga or just have a cup of tea somewhere. And I'd be sort of caning it and then kind yeah. of unable to move on a Saturday. <laughs> oh, so what was it that what was the point in time that really kind of woke you up to the fact that something has got to change here? Did you have a slap in the face from the universe? What was it? What was <laughs> I it? think I had I had numerous slaps in the face. One was related to that Prosecco hour where yeah. um, nothing happened, but I got my team and a member of my team so drunk, a guy, um, that he couldn't get home to his girlfriend and ended wow. up come, having to come back to mine. Um, nothing, and again, it was nothing happened, but I, 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 he was such a nice guy. And he was on the phone the next morning to his girlfriend being honest about what had happened. I just felt like the worst ever. <laughs> I just thought this is rock bottom. And there was another, there were two big events and I'm sure we're all familiar with the you know, you go to a festival because you know, you know it's not the music you're into. It's that day drinking enabling. Yeah. Thing. So I had Notting Hill Carnival that I did every year and I went to an 80s music festival every year. And what I did at those events was drink through them. And both of them were almost blackout scenarios where I did, you know, things that were awful. Or I, I hurt myself at the 80s music festival as a result of drinking um and at, at the carnival I did something that I regretted the next day and those two things I started making a list on my phone of behaviors that I regretted and I added in everything I've still got that list and I look at it if I'm tempted so I'd say there was a cluster of events that may, were kind of you know like a klaxon going off saying, yeah yeah Let's stop it and it wasn't until I was in India and I something maybe the phone could hear me because <laughs> it sent a, a, a piece my way that a journalist like I have never been able to find it since but a journalist described alcohol as a toxic depressant and the word just went bing bang everything went off in my head and I thought toxic depressant it's poison it's poison and I remember sort of still going to the bar the beach bar thinking jokingly in my head thinking I'll have a glass of your best toxic depressant, please. Um, but still having it, but then having it and not getting the same hit, but having a second one and going, it's, I don't feel the same about it. Something just kind of switched in my head. Yeah, and I think once that awareness that this is not serving me in the way that it used to, once that's in your head, I yeah. talk about this in my book, you can't ever go back to ignorant bliss. There's only one yeah. way to go, and that's to start looking closer, educating yourself, and putting into practice what you learn. If you stay in that place, it's awfully painful. You're just constantly 
questioning your behavior, beating yeah. yourself up about it. And, and you can't go back to, oh, it's all fine. Everything's OK. I haven't got a problem. It's once yeah. it's in there, it's in there and you, you've got yeah. to move forward. So so that how did what did you start doing after that? Then did you start? Well, thinking? It was a sort of there was, a, again, a cluster of things. So I had that toxic depressant moment um, and uh what had led up to that was me doing um, I'd left a big corporate job so that stress had gone I'd done yoga teacher training which opened my mind to other ways of living yeah um and um just awareness of what are things that are happening and, and your behaviors and your effect on other people and how you respond to things and therapy um which we can um, come back to but the thing I was in a perfect position to give up. And what happened was someone told me to read This Naked Mind <laughs> by Annie Grace. So many of us inspired by Annie. And um, literally, the, I, I got back from India on the Friday. I met the person who told me to read it in, on a hike on a Saturday. On the Sunday, I downloaded the audiobook and never drank again. Wow. Um, so the power of it, I, I was ready for the words. She backed up the toxic depressant message yeah. and then I read Alcohol Explained by William Porter so the perfect kind of um, yeah the combo. perfect combo yeah and they kept me reading Quitlet and um, Claire Pooley as well all of all of those great books about um giving up drinking and people's stories they they're the new addiction in a way I just yeah I, I know what you mean I mean I filled this yeah. bookcase with sobriety books yeah I was just reading one after another after another I think you're right it can turn that can turn into an addiction all of its own what I love about this naked mind though I, I actually did the same thing you know I got that I had that cognitive dissonance going on I was questioning my behavior my relationship with alcohol I read Annie Grace's book and the big the big takeaway for me was actually the understanding that we can carry false beliefs. I thought, obviously, I thought if I believe something, it must be true. I believed alcohol helped my anxiety. I believed it helped me have fun, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and Annie's book helped me break that down and learn that just because I believe it doesn't mean it's true and it doesn't mean it's helping me. And I, very similar to you, I read that book and felt free and was yeah. able to start moving forward. That, that idea that she really, her book is, is kind of hypnotic in the way it repeats messages. Yeah. And she said she was talking about that thing of, you know, you're having fun anyway. It doesn't come from the alcohol. And then backed up by the, I really enjoyed the science of William Porter's book. I really, I respond to those fact you know what's going on in my brain and he backs that up with the more science and I think those two things together I can now see that I was just fooling myself and that alcohol was just a, had sold me a big lie I think it was that moment where William describes how um you your brain thinks it's feeling happier and there's a kind of gap between your brain registering that it is it, it doesn't connect I think the alcohol effect the anxiety that you get after with after it with the initial um happy feeling so you don't get that connect and you can't see the cycle I think that really really helps me understand what was going on with it and just never looked back although you know I'd be lying if I said I hadn't been tempted but I just reread the books or look at my list of behaviors on my phone <laughs> although I bet now nearly three years into it you hardly ever think about drinking in the context of I want to drink alcohol or if at all um, I do every now and again, I get the temptation, especially lockdown. I, you know, I think a lot of people just thought, how am I going to get through this? It'll be so much easier with a bottle of Prosecco. And um, I kept going using fake. I use fake Prosecco. So no Secco. No Secco, yeah. Zero, the Sainsbury's one, which is really good. There's a whole range of them. And all of that's got much, much better, isn't it? So I've used that. Um, and I'd say I, I live by the sea and I could see people, uh, two women just in sharing a bottle of Prosecco on the pier. And I think, oh, I just love to do that. But I just know what the feeling would be, you know, what the outcome would be, that it doesn't actually give you that real 
feeling it's gone, you know, after the first sip. And I realized for me, the anticipation of the drink and the first sip were the whole enjoyment, everything after that wasn't fun. So um, I've managed to steer clear of it. (laughs) Excellent, good work. Mm. <laughs> so how did you end up writing a book I want to hear all about this let's have a well, look at here the book. it is here it is cheap cheap play live um I, as I say I wrote this when I was in India around the time when I gave up drinking and it was a cathartic outpouring of everything and the first draft I wish I hadn't shown it to everyone because it was quite dark and I think right. you sometimes have to get that darkness out to see the light she says in a yogic way um but that was true and I wrote the dark draft um and fiddled about with it a bit, um, showed it to a few people. It got a very polarized response because, you know, the, the clue is in the title about what I did. Yeah. Um, so um, 50% of people went, whoa, it's amazing. The other 50% were going, I can't believe you did that. Um, and I was very hard on myself in the text and on other people. There's a lot of blame and bitterness. So it wasn't till I came to live by the sea this year, I came back from India for lockdown here. And um, I decided to revisit the book. Um, uh, there's there's a reason why it, that I describe in the book that I came back to, to write it. I wouldn't have got it out if I hadn't met a particular person anyway. Um, so I wrote the book, but I realized now it was all part of the therapeutic thing of going back and discovering the root cause of the drinking, which yeah. is really grief, which is loss of parents and a 10 year old girl who never got over it and locked herself up and drank to, you know, defend the walls kind of yeah. thing. That's who that's what happened. So it is a it is an inner child story. Yeah. And I love the fact that you're so vulnerable so open and able to you know bring the conversation out about these things that a a lot of people find incredibly uncomfortable to talk about but you mentioned the darkness and the light I'm a firm believer that if you let this stuff exist in the darkness that then it thrives whereas if you bring it out into the light you take away its power and I found by right through my own writing and sharing on YouTube etc that I've been able to reclaim the power from my trauma I think very much like me I mean we've had different experiences but we both kind of mm-hmm. had to grow up early we lost parts of our childhood and it was that's a, something very hard to face into uh, those feelings and everything that comes up with it and you can see why with that perfect timing of the 90s drinking culture that alcohol seemed like this magic medicine for us even though we didn't know what we were doing yeah I mean it it did feel I mean part of me thinks I'm quite glad I did some of the I don't regret everything I did while drinking although writing the book made me realize that I had never met a man sober until recently um when that that realization (laughs) filled me with horror you know even the man I married and subsequently divorced I met whilst drunk in Brighton um you know and how many of us have met our partners (laughs) while sober and also I think Mm. even more importantly had Mm. you ever met the real you until you quit thinking so true I've now met I can confirm (laughs) real me the well I've gone back to who I used to be the girl from Wales who I'm the real me is more introverted likes her own company doesn't want a high-flying corporate job is quite happy walking on her own by the sea um and being quiet and doesn't go out at night I have I now say that I have my evenings in the morning I go for a walk and have coffee and meet friends and then I work into the evening quite happy to do it that way around it's much better for me Um, and that that is who I was in Wales before I left at 22. Exactly and yeah I think that whole part of this I funny enough I did a YouTube video recently about it I'll put a link to that as well as a link to your book in the description but I think that second phase of the journey, we quit drinking, there's a honeymoon period, it all feels wonderful and exciting. Then it can go a bit flat as the curtain comes back on, this is who you are, you've got some tough shit to deal with from your past, not for everybody, but a lot of people this comes up. And I think it's about learning to face into that. That's where we start ripping up the roots of why we turn to addictive behavior. And then I think it's about starting to learn to like ourselves 
ourselves and love ourselves and have some compassion for ourselves. I don't know. I don't think the journey ever ends. I think the last opportunity we get to do our work and to keep working on ourselves is like 10 minutes before we die. You know, we, it's just a journey that carries on, but it evolves. It starts with learning to quit. And then it's about all these other elements and parts that start to come up. It sounds like you've made such amazing progress and it's, wonderful you're sharing it through your book and just being so open about your story I think it's an incredible thing thank you yes I the the response to the book is all of those things I thought I would get trolled mercilessly and maybe now I've said that I, I will about what I did it, interestingly no one's mentioned that in fact some people have said um you know you, you lots of us have done it as well um they just haven't admitted it um but mainly people have really appreciated the honesty and the words that keep coming up in reviews are raw honest unflinching brave brutal i think um once once <laughs> used um but that's my honesty is a thing that i've had i had an honesty policy at work and ultimately not everyone likes that but <laughs> i wanted to be completely honest with myself and just say i acknowledge what happened my part in it i'm stopping blaming everyone and taking responsibility for okay. what the part i played i am my own agent I did those things. And I think that's what people um, are responding to. The original version didn't do that. And that is going to remain in a virtual draw. <laughs> <laughs> Never to be blamed, seen every, like blamed everyone in sight. Blamed yeah, I did doing. exactly that um, with my book. There was a lot of blaming of my mother and anger coming out through my words. And actually, I think you know, when you can be really vulnerable and share and take responsibility people buy into that I mean rather like you I started practicing radical honesty 18 months two years ago you know, I, I don't tell white lies bend the truth exaggerate I mean occasionally but I try and catch myself when I do it I definitely don't tell big lies and also like extreme ownership you know I I, I own my stuff if there's a problem I take responsibility because in the past I've been codependent and blame everyone else and want everyone else to fix my problems. I think people appreciate it that actually this person's showing up, they're human, they've made mistakes, yeah. they've taken yeah. some responsibility and now look where they're at. I, I think people appreciate it. So hopefully you won't get trolled. Hopefully. Well, the advice I had, was, which was the best by the person that triggered me writing the book uh, or redrafting it and publishing it this year, she said, um, right from the heart, not the ego. And I literally yeah. went through the draft and took out anything that smacked of ego um, and made sure it was from my heart. It was the best writing advice ever um, because now it, I know people are responding to that. Um, yeah. And it was so easy then to see the ego at work in my book and, and just remove it. <laughs> I mean, I think publishing, self-publishing is an act of ego. Um, but, you know, I'm just, I want, well, the main reason for doing it is to help other people. And hopefully on this sober journey is with the well, it being a key theme. Anyone who's stuck in a similar predicament, there is another side, there is a, a, a better side to life without the veil, the numbing of um, alcohol. And the book's mostly memoir, isn't it? But it, I think it will still be really inspirational for somebody who was perhaps curious about stopping drinking, wondering if it's the right path to take. I think it will. It, I suppose there's two types of book in the kind of quit lit, if you wanted to label it as that, which probably is not quite right but it's yeah. you've got the kind of scientific annie grace william porter this is how you stop drinking books and then there's the kind of claire pooley catherine gray which tells a story and yeah. you can get really immersed in those and i think it'd yeah. be in that, that it's sort definitely of in that and i was inspired by those claire pooley story particularly with her media background and yeah you know immersion in prosecco <laughs> I really, yeah. Yeah. she was very I bridget think. jones <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're all Bridget Jones. And, you know, even now I look at um, television marketed to, to women and it's every single shot has got a glass of Prosecco in it from Real Housewives to Towie, particularly reality TV. It's drenched in the stuff. Yeah. And now it's really obvious to me how prevalent it is. It's just everywhere. 
yeah, it literally starts jumping out at you. And I often yeah. look at the brand in the, the gin bottles, the pink gin, you know, all that sort of thing. And you yeah. just, I actually look at it now, like who who's this aimed at? Who are they trying to target with that one? And I actually saw some uh, some cans of beer recently and it was brew dog and they've partnered up with a chocolate company and i thought that is aimed at kids they're, they're trying to target young people with what they're doing with that which i thought was just disgraceful oh i would have said chocolate might be aimed at women or, or women yeah the galaxy yeah, i didn't flake, think of that actually flake you don't already one who likes chocolate it's the bailey's um bailey's drinker isn't it it's um, yeah good point the, turning alcohol into a dessert yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, that's I I read that as women. Yeah, you're probably right, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but, and I remember somebody who spoke at this Naked Mind Live and she said that that in the marketing um meetings she would have, she she worked at a big alcohol manufacturer, and in the marketing meetings, they would talk about how they could position the product so they could get it in front of more children to get people drinking as early as possible. Just bonkers. I mean, the annoying thing for me is I made a very conscious decision when I was young, when I was a child. My entire family smoked. It was the 70s. That's what people did. I witnessed my dad teaching my siblings how to look cool smoking in the mirror. And I swore to myself I would never do it, particularly as he did end up dying of cancer. And um, because all the messages were there. If I'd known the same facts about alcohol, I would never have started. And I didn't actually really start until I was in my early 20s. I'd managed to avoid it, didn't like the taste of it, didn't want to go there. Um, had a very vivid memory of a family member throwing up at a party that I just didn't want to, you know. Um, and But yeah, I ended up sort of training myself into it because I didn't know the messages I didn't know that it was harmful in exactly the same way as um, smoking. In fact, it's probably even worse. And that yeah. was one of the big reveals of the quitlet, just how carcinogenic it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everything around us at that time was telling us the op absolute opposite. Yeah. This is yeah. cool. This is fun. This is how you relax. Yeah. And even when my mum had dementia, vascular dementia, which is mini strokes, the doctor actually pulled us to one side and said, we see this a lot in ex-colonials um meaning um people who've drunk a lot um wow. when they've been in the colonies <laughs> i think that's what they mean um and even then i was just kind of like a bit blind to it i'd read something that if you ran a lot you know it negated the the effects and so i did run a lot yeah, i used to do that too i thought it yeah. it. <laughs> yeah and it was i think it was just i don't know the doctor said oh you'd be fine you can you run a lot it's fine um but it, no he should have said no it's extremely harmful to you and that it can I, I didn't know the connection between heart problems and dementia and that the clots form you know through problems in the heart that can be caused by alcohol and that those clots end up giving you the strokes and I just didn't know all of that scientific information if I'd if I'd slightly known I'd never have gone near it and I'm really annoyed that I did I'm also annoyed at a you know government that makes 10 billion pounds or whatever well, it yeah. is a year who doesn't want to tell you that because they make so much money off it so that was something that William Porter um flagged up that amount of money that the government make from it and so that message is hidden and anyone who tries to say that message there was an author wasn't or as a there was a professor yeah professor years ago. not yeah uh, he tried to say it and he was squished wasn't he yeah, straight absolutely away. although his book's a bestseller so yeah. <laughs> I think his, book, his book's called drink yes i've got it yeah, yeah. i haven't read it yet but I, i've downloaded it that's um, another good read but you see that all the time, that squishing of the truth. And um, I could see that happening to him because he was trying to say the truth about drinking. It's so obvious. The evidence is all around us. Yeah. Every day, people pouring into the pubs, pouring out of the pub. You can just see it on people's faces. And I saw it on my face. I'm horrified that I even went there. Yeah. And you've, it's just amazing to hear your story and you know, the transformation you've made and now your book. As I say, I'll put a link to your book in the description of the video. So if anyone, I assume it's, is it out now? 
Yeah, so um, I self-published it and um, my own company is Redwood Tree Publishing. So I've got it on a number of outlets. You can order it through um, regular bookshop. It'll take a bit longer to arrive, but it's available on Amazon, Apple, Kobo, Nook, Google Play um, and all good bookshops. Um, Yeah, so order away. Excellent. I'll post a link to it. Is there an audio book? Well, people keep asking me about that um, because I'm self-published. It would be me paying for that. So I've I've made the inquiries. I'd love to read it as a self-publishing your own book is like a legacy thing. It's, I'm, I'm child free by choice, but I feel this book is my baby now <laughs> and I'd quite like to leave the audio version. So um, watch this space. I might do it next year. As I know that um, a lot of people reading Quicklit like to read audio. I did. So, yeah, a lot of people, you know, they'll walk while they're listening. Or, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I used to listen to audio books in the gym when, yeah, when I was working on quitting drinking. So, yeah, yeah. If, if you do, let me know and I'll make sure I share it with the community. I, think I will. I've got enough people asking me about audio. And like I say, it's a legacy thing. That book will live on then. Well, hopefully. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. Oh, it's amazing. It's just so inspirational to hear your story thanks so much for coming on Lisa it's been brilliant thank you